Uh, thank you all for coming. I will just first just take a minute to introduce everyone, and then I will hand over the mics to them. Um, to my extreme right is uh, Mr. V. S. Kundu. I think most of you know about him. He was the Director General of Film Divisions of India from 2012 to 2015. And he was responsible for infusing this new life force in the government institution. And when he left, it was met with much anguish in the documentary filmmaking community. Uh, Mr. Kundu is an IAS officer of the 1986 batch, Haryana Kader, and he holds a master's degree in physics. He has worked in various departments of the government for almost 30 years. Um, to my right is Arundhati Ghosh, who has been a fundraiser at the very beloved India Foundation for the Arts since 2001 and its director since 2013. She received the Global Fundraiser Award from Resource Alliance International and is also a recipient of the Shevening Gurukul Scholarship for Leadership and Excellence from the London School of Economics and is involved extensively and personally with the sustainability of arts in India especially its independence. Um, Sophie Sivaraman is the founding CEO of Indian Documentary Foundation, which was set up to grow and heighten the impact of non-fiction films and media in India. Uh, Sophie is also responsible for bringing the good pitch to India, which is an international forum that brings together documentary filmmakers with foundations and philanthropists for mutual benefits, which she will tell you more about. To my extreme left is Disha. She has been with Kabul area since 2007 and is a key voice in making feminist work vernacular media sustainable. From training, mentoring, strategy to fundraising, Disha has been the country's only, seen the only women-led rural media channel transition from non-profit to profit and is now working as Kabul area's managing director. Uh, Disha has worked in publishing and as a journalist before Kabul area. Uh, now, I will just request each panelist to take five minutes or so to just give us a little context history about their work. Um, some of them are using presentations, but we'd like to start with you, Mr. Kundu. If you can just contextualize the history of documentary in India, especially its relationship with the state, how it evolved, because that's actually how documentaries evolved, uh, and s with a special focus when you were there in film division of India. Hello. Uh, it's a bit of a longish subject, so please uh, feel free to control me if I'm taking too much time. <laughs> and uh, please do excuse me for having a cough, so I might uh, become uncomfortable in between speaking too much. Uh, Films Division is a custodian of the non-fiction cinema promotion in the country, and it has been so for my, ever since independence. The genesis was sometimes in 1941 when the Britishers felt that they need to influence opinion of Indians about their participation in World War II. And they created an organization called Information Films of India. And they created a lot of documentary, not documentary, actually a lot of propaganda films trying to influence Indians to side with the Britishers. And uh, the idea was they, they wanted uh, Gandhiji to ask the country to support the Britishers in their effort. So IFI actually made a lot of propaganda films. None of those survives as of now. In 1947, when the country became independent, uh, the government created two divisions. The idea was to communicate to the newly free citizens of the country what the government is doing for them. So photo division was created to feed print media with photographs of important things going on. And films division was created, which was actually an upgrade from information films of India, to create news reels, which will then travel to different parts of the country and tell the citizens what the government is doing for them. So this, this format actually continued till the 1980s. And at one point of time, Films division was creating news deals, dubbing it into as many as 29 different languages and circulating all over the country. And circulating in tents in... Uh, yeah, 
in, in the beginning, because there were very few cinemas, they would actually take it to cities and villages, take it to village melas, and show them in tent cinemas, and show them in largely crowded localities uh, on, on the rear side of a truck that they had. And gradually, of course, it shifted to the pre-feature uh, newsreel that was shown, you know, as, as films division ki bhet, that I'm sure all the old people here would have seen when they went to see the film. And, and quite, quite a cringing kind of an experience at that time, but yes, uh, that was there. Uh, the films division archives are actually a kind of uh, treasure house as of now because they are a documented history of the country since 1947 and uh, very important aspects of that as well. Film Division also had a very important role because in 1952, Films Division hosted the first international film festival of India in Delhi. And they hosted the first few editions of that. And that is where Indian filmmakers were exposed to the voices, global voices in cinema. And actually Indian cinema, the art cinema, the new realistic cinema actually started evolving from there. Uh, and it became an important voice of artists. So films, cinema as an artistic medium was actually uh, established in the, in the decade, first decade after independence. Uh, in the 1960s, then the government felt that films division has too much on its plate, so they created uh, the Film Finance Development Corporation, which later was rechristened as NFDC, National Film Development Corporation. Uh, they also created, set up FTI in Pune, and Films Division was then given the mandate of looking after the non-fiction cinema. And within Films Division, animation as a division also started. So that is when the, the word documentary was actually adopted in the organization. So they had two broad genres, animation and documentary. And in the 1960s and 70s, uh, documentary as a genre became established in the Films Division and in India through the work of uh, Sukhdev and Shastri and Pramod Pati and other filmmakers of that time. And those were, they were very smart people. They had to work within the government organization and yet they had to give a voice to whatever they really wanted to say. So beautiful films have been created at that time. And those films have shaped to a very large extent even the current generation of documentary filmmakers in the country, at least up to now till the advent of the digital media, until the advent of the internet, the major influence on documentary filmmakers was <coughs> the films that were made by Films Division in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and the films that Films Division brought in as the, uh, as the packages in the Mumbai International Film Festival, which was started in 1990. So that's the primary documentary film festival still in the country. It's a biennial, held every two years. And that further uh, brought, uh, you know, the, the cutting edge documentary cinema of the world into India. And that kind of mentored the Indian documentary filmmakers. <coughs> so that's the history. I landed up in uh, Films Division in 2012. <coughs> By that time it was a kind of a marginalized organization because NFDC and feature films had actually taken over. Documentaries were kind of looked down as, on as, as boring cinema, especially the films division cinema. There were a lot of good documentaries being made, but they were all being made outside uh, films division. Yet it was, because of the history, because of the tradition, it, it was an organization that was loved by most of the documentary filmmakers. So uh, we just wanted to get them back into the fold of Films Division. So we started actually working to bring the filmmakers back in FD. We started a film screening program called FD Zone, which was curated by independent filmmakers. And they chose the films, they chose the themes. And that became a very, very popular initiative. <clears throat> it was adopted in different parts of uh, India as well. One edition started in Bangalore also and ran for some time. Uh, that opened up the space to independent filmmakers. <clears throat> we also then associated them in all the major decision making. So Films Division used to fund uh, films through two means. One was in-house directors, they would make films. 
Uh, one method was what was called a commissioned film, which was uh, we hired a director who would use films division crew and make a film. And he was paid a certain fee. And the third, uh, which was called outside production, was basically commissioning films to outside filmmakers who will use their own crew and make films, which will be owned by films division. Uh, there were a lot of issues that the filmmakers had because they felt that uh, they are not allowed to make the kind of films that they want to make. So there was limitation on the subjects that they had. There was limitation on their ability to show those films around in institutions or to participate in film festivals. And uh, FD was a government organization, so there was a certain tardiness to the processes involved. So we kind of eased everything up. Uh, we created a very transparent selection system for proposals, a three-tiered system. So the first, first uh, set was where the filmmakers would make a proposal, which would be then screened by an in-house team, but it was a blind screening. The filmmakers won't know who the proposal is from. And then they will say if the proposal is okay to be taken to the next stage and there should be an interview with the filmmaker, uh, what he is trying to do. Uh, so there was a regional selection committee constituted of uh, one director from Films Division and uh, three or four directors who were independent filmmakers who would actually have a detailed discussion with the filmmaker and then see if the proposal is okay. Uh, since we are spending public money in Films Division, so we were very careful that the, the money should only be spent on projects that are worthwhile. And if the second projection, if the second screening committee meeting went well, then the final decision was taken at the final uh, screening committee level, which was again a combination of independent filmmakers, senior filmmakers, and uh, DG of the films division. And then a final commissioning was uh, done. The result was that in the three years that I was there, films division reaped something like 21 national awards in documentary, which was a kind of a record for films division as well. Most of those uh, with, with the outside producers, uh, including one film that uh, Ruhi Dekshet had made, a beautiful film. So we, uh, we are actually very proud of what Films Division was able to do in those three years. Subsequently, uh, the people who actually headed the organization also had other responsibilities. They were not full-time in charges, so a bit of it has been rolled back. But uh, the selection process still stays there, and as soon as the funding becomes available again, which is, you all know the status of the economy uh, of the country, so I think funding has dried up as of now, but whenever it becomes available again, I'm sure the organization will, uh, will be there for the filmmakers. One other good thing that happened in the organization is that we set up uh, the National Museum of Indian Cinema in the premises of the Films Division. And as of now, Films Division has five full-fledged auditoria, uh, three of them equipped with uh, 5.1 surround sound and DCP projection. And so it's a, it's a space that all the filmmakers can actually claim and, and, and create a hub of non-fiction cinema there. So that has been the, the broad history. Yeah. Thank you. Arundhati, would you like to? Hello. Yeah, I just have a couple of slides to give you a sense of uh, what India Foundation for the Arts has been up to as far as films are concerned. Uh, yeah, uh, just for those who may not know a little bit about the foundation itself, it's a national uh, foundation, it's a public charitable trust set up in 93, and we support arts and culture projects across the country. A little bit to just say that over the years, 24 years we've been around, over 600 grants, about 255 million Indian rupees, and uh, tons of project outcomes. And if you see, the outcomes of our projects have been performances, archives, films, um, exhibitions, installations, workshops, seminars, all different kinds of things. What we, su we support um, projects under different uh, a variety of programs, arts research, practice, arts education, Project 560, archives and museums. The two non-funding uh, pro uh, programs are SMART and the IFA archive are setting up. 
But essentially what ties all our projects together in some way is these three things. Critical work that challenges dominant narratives, journeys that seek unheard voices and untold stories, investigations, explorations, and experiments across the practice and knowledge of the art. So these are the three uh, sort of key at the core of all the projects that we support. So if you actually go to our website and look at the, the 600 projects we've supported, you will find in some way they respond to um, these three core ideas. Now coming to films, we don't, we don't support, so if you asked me do you support documentary film, I would have to give you a very complicated answer because we don't support documentary film in that sense. What we do support is films under the various programs. So IFA does not, we don't break up our programs um, as, as disciplines, like there's not a, we don't have a dance program and a music program and a film program. What we have is, so we support films under arts research, for example, where the film could be an outcome of research, the film could be a process methodology of doing research, where you look at practice as research. When we, if you look at our arts practice program, under which some films have been supported, there really what we're looking at is, how is the filmmaker experimenting or exploring with the form, with the content, with the way the film engages the audience, all these different things that are critical questions about arts practice, the practice of filmmaking itself. We also have under both research and arts practice, we have facilitation grants as well, which are around building workshops, seminars, residencies. So to say that filmmakers could um, apply to us for doing seminars, workshops, or residencies. Now in terms of what we've tried to support, if you look at, I'll show you a list, we are very proud of the, of the journeys of filmmakers we've been able to support since 1995, and I'll show you a quick list of that because we are indeed very proud and delighted that we could be in small ways part of their journey. Uh, what we've always attempted to do is question the idea of the document in the documentary. Whose document is it? What does it do? Who does it belong to? Uh, how do you excavate a document? What, what is it really? Is it archived material? Is it things that you can see, touch? Is it tangible? Is it whispers? Uh, is it part memory, part fantasy? What is really the idea of the document? So many of the films that IFA has supported, you will see um, filmmakers uh, struggling, exploring with the idea of the document itself. We also like uh, to support those journeys that are pushing at the boundaries of filmmaking. I was glad I could hear part of uh, Paramita's conversation about her film, and, and she was talking about this whole uh, thing about what is fiction, what is non-fiction, what lies in between, how these boundaries are blurred. Uh, what do you call a documentary, really? So, you know, when we are looking at proposals, we are often asking, where's the filmmaker? Who's the filmmaker? Is the filmmaker in the film? Is, where is the filmmaker standing in the film? Inside it, on the side, on the margin, outside it? All of that makes a difference because um, how the filmmaker imagines the film also questions these boundaries of documentary. So we, we love to push those edges and, um, and see what, how that will shape the, the final film that comes out. Reimagining its possibilities with changes in technology, processes of making distribution, sharing, viewing. This is a learning process, I guess, for us as well as for, for the filmmakers who apply to us. That in this world where technology is changing so fast, the ideas of sharing, the idea of copyright, copyleft, how do you use other people's material, how do you use material that doesn't belong to you but you want to use in a film, all of this is changing very fast. The, most of the realities around this are not even clear or, or are interpretable in multiple ways. So in that context, in that environment, what are you supporting? The one thing very clear about IFA is that we don't own copyright of anything that we support. All the copyright is um, owned by the artists. Um, and what we have is just license, creative uh, uh, sort of uh, screening license, and we take permission to use frames. I mean, if you're producing 
uh, promotion material from, uh, for IFA. But even screening license, every time we send a film to a film festival, we have to ask. We ask the filmmaker if they are okay with it. Because, you know, there's so many things involved. We might be participating in a film festival which is supported by a funder that a filmmaker might have objections to. And ultimately, it's the filmmaker's work. So, um, budgets and copyrights, uh, our budgets are small. We don't have, so under the arts research program, the budget cap is now four lakhs. And under arts practice, it's five. As you know, it's not possible often to make a film within that budget. So our filmmakers are free to uh, raise extra money from wherever, except that we would, uh, we want to make sure that they respect the same copyright that we respect. So if a filmmaker wants to take money from another donor, where that donor wants to own the film, we'll have issues with that. Because for us, uh, the fact that the filmmaker owns copyright is important. Now, this is a more recent uh, shift uh, at IFA. Earlier, it, it wasn't that. And what had happened is often when other donors fund the rest and they own that material, the filmmaker does not have any rights over their film, which we don't think is such a great idea. Uh, to give you numbers, uh, so far about 39 films and another seven are in production as we speak. They are current grants. Also, other than what I will show you, the list of films that we've supported, films have often been uh, ways to document projects. For example, we, we, may, be doing, um, we may be supporting a workshop on, uh, say, an exploration around puppetry, and there is a filmmaker there who's made a film on that entire exploration, say, over 14, 15 days, and that becomes an independent film. So many of our programs actually or and projects actually have filmmakers working with them that's not listed here because that's like that's many many and many of these films are also documentary films which find their way into screenings and festivals and other kinds of archives um, documentation of projects within uh, arts research arts practice but also arts education film is becoming even for so under our arts education program we support a lot of work that artists and teachers do in government schools in rural karnataka and we've seen most teachers want to make a film at the end of it so they make a 7 to 10 to 12 minute film on what they've done that whole year and they are online they're learning how to make films they're learning how to edit films and, and it's amazing because they produce this 12 to 15 minute film which become like uh, a sort of a, a, a document, a, almost a witness of what has happened in their school in that time and we find that uh, truly enabling and speak about at a, at a forum like this one. Uh, and now for the films that we've supported, these are the 39 that we've supported. I'm so delighted that over the last six years at uh, Urban Lens, Shivashree, so many of these filmmakers have been here and that makes us very happy. So this is, this is the list. Something that I would uh, like to make clear is that IFA is not an organization that has uh, a tree or a well where you can find lots of money. We would have loved to do that, but we don't. What we have is a corpus the interest of which just takes care of 50% of what we spend. The rest 50% is raised year on year from different kinds of donors. They include international and national foundations, individuals, corporates, other NGOs, all kinds of sources. What does not ever happen is our donors do not dictate what we fund, not just in films, in any other projects. It's very clear. Uh, donors can support programs. Uh, and donors can support projects after we've decided to fund them. So we send like a menu card, a list, saying, okay, so this quarter, these are the seven projects we've supported. Would you like to support any of them? Even when donors support programs, they have no say in, the, uh, in who gets uh, a grant from us. Neither does our board. So who decides? Essentially, there's an internal evaluation by uh, our teammates. And there is an external evaluation by experts from the field, peers, specialists in the areas that we are looking at, and, and films as well, so follows the same routine across our programs. So it's important to mention this because 
I think we will spend a little time talking about the independence of films and of any art project for that matter, especially today. Um, so it's important to say that our donors have no say in what we are ultimately funding. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sophie. Yeah. Hi. Okay, I come from the impact space, which is um, the foundation, which is Indian Documentary Foundation. Uh, when we were looking at the foundation when we first started and we looked at uh, what exactly, in which way are we going to move this foundation definitely in documentary. A question that really came up into all our heads was, especially mine, is that when I watch a documentary film, is I'm extremely curious to know what happened next. What happened? I mean, what happened to the boy? Did he get educated? Or what happened to that girl? Did she get, I mean, did she have an early marriage or did she manage to stop it? I mean, did the parents come into the picture? The story never got completed for me you know, after watching a documentary film. And that really began to irk me quite a bit. And then it was about how are we able to, and I used to actually call up filmmakers and ask them as to, listen, what happened to that boy? I mean, did, did, did education happen? Did you manage to get funding to, you know, put that child through education? So, and the, it never really, really satisfied my curiosity. And then from that came the idea of, okay, let's take the film after it's completed and let it continue on its journey. At that point of time, we really didn't know that there was any kind of, uh, the impact movement is actually very, very new. It's almost like maybe 10 years, 11 years old. And the word impact producer actually came about maybe eight years ago when a whole bunch of us met, in a, met, met uh, abroad and we discussed the, the role that is needed by somebody to play this because filmmakers are filmmakers. And... Um, from there, we took it to, I to approach Bina Paul of Kerala Film Festival. And um, she said, okay, let's try it out. And we brought it out in a very, very small um, level in the first year. The second year, we brought it out again. And then we got it recognized internationally and then connected ourselves to the global program, the Impact Program, which is a good pitch global program, which is run by Doc Society and Sundance Institute. And we've been doing that consecutively every two years. We bring it in every two years. And Mr. Kundu was the one who came in and helped us bring it the first time around in 2014. And from then on, we have grown. So what we primarily do is that we select documentaries which are very, um, you know, which has a very strong issue-based documentaries, very creatively told stories and we bring them into the center and we keep that as a center and we create partners around the documentary and create funding in terms of outreach funding in in a targeted approach towards a target audience and in uh, who will benefit by seeing the documentary and be able to facilitate a behavior change or policy change or awareness and things like that so to be able to give you a much more visual representation of it. I'll just run a highlights trailer of our last forum so you get an idea of what the feel of it is. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held We are incredibly grateful to Tata Trusts for supporting Good Pitch India, for seeing the potential of the change that these films can make. In a first of its kind initiative, we are supporting a platform that promotes inspirational social justice films by connecting them to different change makers around the world. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. We believe climate change is the biggest threat to human rights and one of the biggest injustices of our time. Driving with Selvi is a feature-length documentary which tells a story about a former child bride who ran away from an abusive marriage. You have seen me in the last good pitch how I was. I have changed. And the work I did with so many young girls has changed me. How can we work with films regarding the work that we do? This is all really about starting conversations that can push these films forward. I saw a silhouette of a girl on a wall with the hashtag Missing Girls. I discovered the work of Lina Kedriwal. Essentially, I'm an artist, so I need all the help. I think we can do stuff around this that can really become a groundswell of conversation and movement and, and hopefully lead to action from there. I'm willing to just give in five lakhs of rupees for that. A post-production facility uh, in Mumbai, Cool Lab, offering post-production support for climbing up hill and missing girls. So we will uh, set up one center for you wow. in, the, in there. Excel. We would love to bring all of the filmmakers and the protagonists 
all expenses paid for two days workshop to meet with other donors and especially NGOs who work in these courses that you guys do. Um, we are here today to ask you to join us in this process of actively hoping change into being for those born into livelihoods of caste-based prostitution. My mom has put me in the first place in this work. She was 15-16 years old. Until now, I have to say that the girl who is born is not born. I have to say that I have to say this in the community. So we could start a conversation with the people who are leading those uh, anti-human trafficking units. We can ensure that those neighborhoods, children are not being sold in anymore. We can distribute and we can disseminate and organize screenings through our um, uh, uh, UN Women offices. I pledge my support in networking and getting the film screened and taking it to a broader audience. I promise to screen the movie in every single cinema. Thank you. I would be very happy to contribute my time, my connections uh, and personal funds to make sure that the movie is done by the end of the season. Because I have two special kids, my family has stopped keeping a relation with us. But I would thank my kids that because of them, the world is my family now. This film will create awareness and increase support for families with children with autism and hearing disabilities. We are just so glad that you're making this film because we were waiting for a film like this to be made. I'll be there for whatever I can do in terms of uh, even trying to get the funding, trying to get uh, a platform to create that awareness about the film. Thank you. We have a three kind of support for you, sir. One, funding. Two, the technical help. And three, making the film going to the public. Um, I wanted to give 10,000 rupees to Lakshmi for her jewelry business. So we'd like to take your film around the globe if we can. Wow. Congratulations. If you identify one or more organizations that work in physical or mental health issues in India, we'll commit 25 lakhs to any organization of your choice. This rather unusual image uh, intrigued us and uh, we followed it to know more about Khabar Leheria, a newspaper uh, that is written, edited, produced and marketed by marginalized women in rural India. So I hope that we will support our support. Tell us how you feel you can partner with this film. Uh, I would immediately like to offer 400 locations all over the country in 25 states to be screened. So they will have access and be eligible to apply for like our world-renowned edit labs. I know that our team uh, has already had a conversation um, with Caballeria, but I'm very, very keen to continue that and see um, if there's an opportunity for us to work with them further. Once again, pledge uh, 10 smartphones for their coverage. I would love to contribute $3,400 to cover area. You have access to over 8,000 NGOs, 400 social enterprises. Tell us how you feel you can partner with this film. You know, if, if Mira were to stand in front of any one of our corporate donors, I think there would be many zeros in front of, uh, you know, the number that they'd put out there. One of the things that we would invite you to, to do is to become members of uh, IPI, and as members, IPI will provide you and all of your staff with press cards. Um, I have bought a scooter for Mira today. And for this lovely table, thank you. Thank you all. Good Pitch India is supported by Tata Trust and um, it's changed the game in the level of the support that we have got. They've been committed and passionate and thank you to the team from Tata Trust. Imagine all the Sharing all the world Where the so that's pretty much what we do. We facilitate partnerships for filmmakers and uh, uh, to be able to go that extra mile and make it 
travel wherever the filmmaker wants to take it. So it's very, very strategic. The whole process is very strategic in terms of its outreach. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, I feel like uh, kind of out of place on the panel, and now I feel like a protagonist, and I'm supposed to be speaking as a producer and a creator, so I feel like it makes sense that I feel out of place. Um, so um, I'm from Kabbalaheria. I have some slides, but they, I mean, I can do an intro to Kabbalaheria without um, really talking to those. Um, although I did want to say that this slide um, was uh, one of my favorite photographs on our many, many Kabbalaria WhatsApp groups, which is in response to a rural woman being asked about what she thinks about her local MLA. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> screw fractions and, you know, the, the kinds of formats that you ask questions in. Um, so Kabbalaria is a, is a collective, a feminist collective, uh, and we can't we say that we're a feminist collective, so I feel really appreciative in audiences when, when we can say this is what we are. We're a feminist media collective. Um, we produce uh, news, basically, media content from uh, rural areas and specifically um, eastern and southern uh, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, we work with a group of completely marginalized women, so Dalit, Muslim, tribal women, who we train as journalists and who produce news, hyperlocal news in their own languages from their areas. Um, we started as a newspaper and a chain of local language newspapers um, almost 20 years ago now. Um, and in the last um, three years, we've pivoted in a big way. I mean, I think that we have been pivoting over 20 years because if you have um, media that's being produced by people on the margins, who are not really meant to be knowledge producers and creators, um, trying to fit into the formats that are available for media production, news production, film production, um, any kind of production, then those formats are kind of straight jackets in a way. Um, but I think that's always been the, the challenge and the stimulus to say that um, there can be other voices of media production and news production as well. And uh, let's see what those voices do to the actual formats. So, um, so we started off as a newspaper. We started off with non-literate women writing news and seeing what that did to the format of a newspaper. Um, and in the last two or three years, we've become a video-first digital news platform. So we're basically a YouTube channel that broadcasts news from 13 or 14 districts of UP and MP to an audience of about 10 million every month. We produce about 200 um, news stories and kind of short format documentaries, so uh, I would say. Um, we speak, I think, to the huge shift that's happened, the possibilities of digital production in India, the possibilities that uh, cheap data and smartphones have provided. Um, so with all the, the straight jackets and all the um, political manipulation and, and the fake news, and, and which is what we spend a lot of time doing. It's also opened up um, what we can do in terms of getting these voices out and changing the shape of storytelling um, completely. The other shift that we've made is um, we've kind of experimented with different forms of fundraising for news production or media production that's for a rural audience and for a marginalized audience. So if you don't really have an audience that's going to pay, it's, it's not an advertiser-friendly audience and it's not really a consuming audience, then who's going to pay for media that's going to produce it? It's only the government who will tell them to use toilets and so on, who's going to pay for the content that goes out to them. But no one's really asking that audience what they might want to um, watch or hear or how they might want to see themselves. Um, so the selfie at, at the end. I mean, I think that what Kabbalaria does is um, creates content um, by rural audiences, so how they want to see themselves and maybe how they would like the world to also be seeing them uh, in, in different ways. Uh, so we've moved from being a nonprofit to a for-profit uh, because it just 
um, has given us a little bit more flexibility, elasticity in producing different kinds of media. And and you know, and I think um, in this time, um, and I was just resonating a lot with Mr. Kunru, um, to be able to create an institution um, that tells the story of this country where we are. Uh, I don't think that there are very many organizations that do it. And we have um, 300 million people who are on the internet but from rural areas. And um, do we really know what kinds of stories, what kinds of lives, what kinds of loves and losses? Um, what are the new forms of romance? What are the new kinds of political mobilization? I don't think that we really know it from, from them. Um, so, so this is what Abad Media is. Thank you. I think between all of you here, we sort of at least see or imagine what nonfiction can look like going forward. And I want to just jump straight in um, and contextualize this conversation about funding in today's socio-political climate. Uh, because which is why also it's critical to talk about uh, funding and how it may be shaping the kind of documentaries that may be made or any kind of nonfiction that may be made. So. I want to, uh, Mr. Kundu, just ask you, how would, what would you say is the value of a documentary? I want to put the word value here, because value is not always the financial value of a film. And what is the value of a documentary in today's India? And how could the government in an ideal state, and let's not call it the government, how could an ideal state want a documentary movement to speak for the country? Uh, okay. A very complicated question, but <laughs> see, so I'll have to give you maybe two or three different answers to that. So far as value of a documentary film is concerned, I think this is the most powerful expression of audiovisual in, in any kind of a genre. See, if, if you look at a blockbuster, uh, your protagonist or your hero will have to suffer maybe 30 bullet wounds and a few amputations to generate some kind of empathy in the, in the audiences. <clears throat> because everyone knows it's a fiction, you know. It's, it's all staged. There's nothing true about it. And in a documentary, even though, as, as Rahul had said in the morning, you know, it, it, a lot of it is crafted. Some of it is staged. But the general belief in the audiences is that what is happening on the stage, on the screen, is true. And therefore, a scratch actually brings up an empathy in the audiences. So the, the possibility of a documentary to engage audiences with an intensity that does not happen in, in fiction or animation forms. That is the power of the documentary cinema. Uh, most of the documentary filmmakers, of course, know and play with this power. And yeah, of course. But that does not really take away the value of it because when in an organized way, a good craftsman brings a social issue through a well-told story in a documentary, the amount of impact can be huge. I'm sure all of us who have watched documentaries have been changed by some documentaries just by viewing it once. We have seen that once and we are suddenly more aware, we are suddenly more sensitive, we are suddenly more sympathetic to the people who have undergone those challenges. So what is the value it has for the state? So the value, let's see, the state would, of course, again mean different things. But the value is that it's an extremely important genre of cinema which needs to be promoted, which can be used by the state to fight a whole lot of melodies within the society. And which is, which is why, you know, all those what we call the public service films are actually all documentaries, essentially, even though those could be completely enacted, you know. The message films could be completely enacted. But if they are not enacted, if there are true protagonists, if there are real-life stories there, the public service films will make that much more an impact. If you have that glitzy um, uh, production of, you know, Swachh Bharat Andolan and that kind of stuff, people would immediately brush it away as, as propaganda. But if, they, if it is well-told story, using real-life stories, real-life characters, the government can actually use it 
as a very, very powerful media of agency of change. And they have been using it at times, but that again would depend on the dispensation. But I think a serious, a serious government would definitely at all times, irrespective of the status of the economy, would definitely at all times spare some funds for the promotion and creation of such films which apart from documenting the current socio-economic political history of the country can also be very powerful agents of change. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, Sophie, the same question, but how is the Indian documentary, <coughs> how is that valued? I'll go back to the same word, through the international lens. And how has that changed over the years? Let's say even if you can just map the trends over the last decade, uh, and how the value of the Indian documentary is changed and how they do value it from the international lens. Okay. Pardon? Pardon? Well, um, I feel the value of the documentary really starts with the value that the filmmaker places on the documentary itself. I'm, here I'm talking about the monetary value and not the social impact value, but the monetary value. And um, in that case, I feel the... Uh, well, the administrative organizations of the country has done, not done very well in encouraging a fairly um, self-esteemed, um, you know, what, what do you call it, acknowledgement of the finances to a documentary. So therefore, um, the filmmaker tends to devalue the documentary when they are putting in the proposals internationally to what the actual value exists. Because the kind of paperwork that you do is the same that you have to do for everybody. So I mean, why would you want to spend so much time doing paperwork for something which is 20 lakhs when you'd much rather do paperwork for something which is like a crow, for example? You know, it's a lot of paperwork that you have to do. So the value that the filmmaker puts to the, their own work is devalued. So you're saying filmmakers should ask for more? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in terms of the kind of funding trends you have seen internationally? Well, in terms of... impact-based? Uh, yes. It um, in fact, we were all, like I said, the word, when the word impact producer started, there was a time when there was a shift of heads that was happening, like Kara was leaving, when Kara Mertes was leaving uh, Sundance and moving into, um, uh, in, you know, into Ford, then Tabitha was moving, Jackson was moving from BBC and moving into Sundance, and there was a major shift of heads happening. And at that point of time, a whole lot of us were called in from all over the world to convene to, uh, on a three, four days, um, you know, talk on what's happening in our countries was a wee documentary. And what came out very strongly is that with the populist era that we are in right now, it becomes more and more important that um, we resist as much as we can with our craft. And therefore, there is um, emphasis pay, uh, being placed on the um, social impact angle which a documentary can have, more than whether the documentary is just a poetic documentary or a highly creative one. But if it has a, a, a possibility of an actionable change, there is more you know, chances of funding. Um, not us per se, but I just wanted to respond to that from our location, which is that um, rural media is really has a value only if it has an impact. Because why else would a woman on a farm be wanting to watch entertainment if it didn't have? Um, and so <laughs> um, I think that uh, we've really, really, really struggled with this and the word impact kind of, you know, with all due apology and we <laughs> it makes my skin crawl because I really think that documentaries and media has a value in and of itself for everyone. I mean, we all have access to all kinds of media, too much media, and, and we all should. And I, and I feel like it, um, it gives the idea of citizenship meaning because if someone who you don't think of as a citizen or a marginal citizen can create media, can create a document of any kind, 
um, I think that it's concretizing and um, um, making valid uh, her stake in in the in the state and the nation, and and just that voice out there has has great value. So I think that there's really a a, a need to state that that this content has a value in and of itself, and it doesn't have to have a toilet at the end. <laughs> and in, in fact, to just uh, uh, carry on about the impact part, so uh, it, it is something that filmmakers are noticing, though, that even though we want our films to have a value in and of itself, um, uh, often we need to be able to locate it in a larger socio-economic narrative, purely for funding purposes. And no, I don't agree with that. Yeah. I think if you have a really good story, and the way you treat your story is like your own personal voice, I mean, they are most beautiful to watch, and anybody will get into it. I mean, you don't have to really be having a social impact course at the end of it. I mean, I work in that space, so we're very driven towards issue-driven documentaries. And uh, what I was do talking about is international funding. But uh, where national funding is concerned, when you're working with social impactful documentaries, I mean, you find out the cost of your documentary, which is um, whether it's women empowerment or whether it's environment. And it has to be, very, I mean, if you're doing a documentary which is very topical, I mean, right now environment is very topical. So anything which is being done on environment, I mean, you approach environment agencies and you, you speak to them about it, there's chances of you know, your film, if it is a very well-told story and uh, a dialogue that is coming into an existing conversation and can add to that conversation, definitely so. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely a great possibility for approaching th those kind of routes. I mean, yes, to just add to that, you can, of course, comment on the value of a documentary. I also want you to sort of take us through how you have negotiated artistic freedom despite having corporate donorship for years? Before I come to that, I, a couple of responses, and they might be very uh, scattered thoughts, but one is uh, what we often understand as hashtag trending. What is trending in the funding world? Who's creating these trends? Whose agendas are these? I think when we say that, um, you know, today, <clears throat> you know, make a film on a queer subject, funding is easy. Make a film on climate change, funding is easy. We have to ask somewhere, who is making this thing easy? Where is it coming from? Whose agenda is this? Often these are funder agendas which have nothing to do with our realities, often. Uh, our realities, the questions we ask, may be totally different. So I think as um, funding bodies or as platforms uh, for uh, arts practitioners to come together and artists, we do have to ask questions about these. That's one. The second thing is about arts funding and impact measurement. These two things have always been at loggerheads, 18 years in this work. And I have faced it from day one, and I still face it. Um, and it's, it's very disturbing that there are these two words, you know, art for art's sake. I hate it. <laughs> and then there is art for change. Because what does it even mean? I still, in 18 years, haven't been able to figure out what it means, actually. What is this art sake? Whose sake are we talking about? I mean, artists make work because of a variety of reasons. And I have never heard any artist say this. I'm making this for art's sake. Like, you know, koi hai wa, art hai, uske liye bana rahi hu main. So, and therefore impact, the word impact measurement has to be dealt with, um, with, with some amount of strictness, you know, and it shouldn't be let loose uh, in arts funding. Um, what we must ask is, is this work that's, is it, why is it relevant? Why is the arts practitioner wanting to make this work? What are the questions that are, uh, that are disturbing them well, in, well enough to move away from uh, life, safety, and security and actually become an arts practitioner and make work? Those are the things I, f I often feel are, are more important. 
and um, why is it critical who is it critical to uh, what not not so much how will this change the world because i've often felt you know you you make a mess of the world with your with your gender caste religion politics economy everything and then expect artists to fix everything with the art that they are going to make i think that's like that's insane to ask of anybody um so and of the artists as well coming to negotiations there are so much about negotiations that one can talk about and so much one can't right um so the answers remain in this realm of fact and fiction always much like probably documentary cinemas and you know cinema as such well one thing is this this idea that when we go to a donor it's very clear that you don't have a say on what's going to be funded with this fund you can give us a general donation you can support um uh, so i'll give you an example for the past two years uh, titan a uh, company has been supporting our arts practice uh, program and they support all the grants so when we take out the call saying we are requesting for proposals for the uh, sorry not arts, arts uh, practice arts research program for the last two two years so when we take out the call there's a line that says that titan so it could be that artists who have an issue with taking money from a corporate like titan will not apply we know that what we try and say very clearly is that titan company does not choose the grants the grants are still chosen by uh, by an expert panel which is like what expert panels have always been titan doesn't even choose the expert panel nor does titan have any say in the in in me and my colleagues and our decisions on what will go to that expert panel uh, if that uh, produces enough confidence then i then i feel artists anyway apply so when we go for funding it's very clear uh so far have we had issues with has anything changed recently no and it won't we don't want to change it we have actually said no to funding where we felt it might push us in different ways we have been asked questions by funders um are you left wing uh <laughs> to which my response has been that you know uh, we recently supported a photographer shomo shankar bosh who's reconstructing the disaster at uh, the human genocide that happened in mori chapi in 1979 so if we were left wing would we support an artist to look into the travesty that the left government did in west bengal so we and uh, many times we just play it with humor we smile and say no government of any color will like us because that's what artists are right artists are constantly questioning anything that is an authority in power it's questioning power actually so whichever right left center whatever color of government there is if artists question authority and power uh that's what if you would always support because if you support artists and what they want to make yeah so lots of such conversations around negotiations disha i just wanted to talk to you about so you had brought up about how you khabal area is one of the greatest examples i have seen which has responded to the possibilities of digital and non fiction uh, and as you said not only about who creates who the creator is but also the kind of stories that it can uh, produce I want to just talk a little bit about data. Today, if my uh, is Khabal area at five million views, ten million views. Okay, and the views are rural India. So about sixty percent of the views are rural MP and um, UP. Yeah, and about twenty percent of the views are um, from the Gulf and Gujarat, so migrant tracts. Hmm. um and the remainder are metros like hmm. delhi and bombay and bangalore so how does data influence because now i know that khabal area is going to produce more longer and longer formats of non fiction experiment with other kinds of non fiction work all video based how is data going to influence a the kind of revenue generation that may come 
with Caballeria? Because that is that a possibility of funding that people are looking at? I know the OTT platforms look at the same revenue generation, right? Which is views. So is Caballeria also looking at data as a revenue generation? And if yes, then what are the politics around it and how does that shape the kind of content that you will make? Uh, it's an uncomfortable space to be in, I have to say. It's exciting and it's also really uncomfortable because you don't know if you're doing anything right any day of um, going into work. Um, so I guess different kinds of understandings of data, right? I guess one way in which to think about it is that um, now we have access to the analytics of who's consuming uh, data. So Kabbalaria, the newspaper, um, the journalist herself would go and distribute the newspaper in uh, where she was news gathering. So there was a close connection between the producer of the content and the consumer of the content. And then when we started experimenting with digital, we said that that is a huge loss because that connection between the producer and one of the critiques that we had of mainstream media when we started Kabbalaria was that um, the media doesn't really speak to or for everyone. It's only speaking for and to those in power, those in cities. And um, so we wanted to change that with Kabbalaria. So the actual physical process of producing and distributing was a big part of that. And with digital, it's suddenly so transient. You don't know who you're producing for. You don't know who's consuming. Um, so it was a little bit uncomfortable. And, and I think that the so much excitement about uh, these numbers of the audience spiraling. I mean, we, we used to produce a pin, print run of 4,000 copies, which would re reach about 40,000 readers. And then 8,000 copies that would reach about 80,000 users. But in you know the first year of producing digital content, we were reaching lakhs and lakhs of viewers uh, um, every week, almost with with some stories. So um, so that so that was really powerful, I think. And and I think that the other thing was that with print, we always had no bylines. So the actual identity of the content creator. Uh, was a collective. It was a collective of women, and so when people read Khabar Lahiriya, it was that oh, it wasn't that Shiv Devi's story has been published, or so there was no bylines and credits. And slowly, with digital, the face of the reporter, the piece of the camera of the reporter, became a part of the story. That the storyteller was a big part of the story. Uh, and so, in a context where the people we knew the people consuming online content were almost all men and uh, predominantly upper class, upper caste, educated men. What was going to be the impact of these Dalit women producing content uh, and fairly controversial content because the sources of the stories were all, were mostly um, marginalized voices. Um, so not in the Thakur Basti, but in the Dalit Basti and uh, so on. So, um, so it was. It was really exciting to look at the the viewership and calibrate how we were performing by the ways in which the viewership was increasing, and it was. It was really exciting. So that was that was one part of I think um, having the confidence to step into this kind of new digital video world, which we had no experience with. We were print journalists. Um, the other part of it has been having using that data to, over the past three years, track what people are watching. And so, uh, and then be able to, um, in some sense at least, recalibrate the content production itself. I mean, what is the content that we want to produce? What is the content that the audience wants? And how you balance that line? So we did a lot of data crunching in the last one year, for example, when funding sources were drying up and we wanted to see how is, how is our content going to be able to raise revenue? What is it that people will pay to watch? Um, sex and crime, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so how do you do you know, like strong feminist reporting around, around sex and crime? There are ways. Um, and, um, but a lot of, um, basically we were able to track that the more hyper-local the content, the, the, the better it did. So you could have a story about a tube well in a village, and if you had in YouTube the name of the village and the block and the district prominently 
uh, highlighted, then you're, you could have millions of views on that video of one, one tube well in one village. So I think that the, the data made us more confident of the product, that, that it didn't, you didn't necessarily have to have uh, stories that had universal relevance. You could have a hyper-local story that would earn you quite a lot of revenue on YouTube. Um, so, so I think that was affirming. But then we also had to look at data, you know, also to see that news will not always pay for itself. And especially if news is pushing up against um, powers that be, uh, we're not going to get advertisements. I mean, the last 12 months, at least the way that Facebook and YouTube algorithms have changed, we have got, you know, at least 60% of our stories have been demonetized. And this is in a context where you have like viral, communal fake news spreading. But even then, it, when you have a local agency that's doing fake news busting, those stories are being demonetized on YouTube. Really? Yeah. So, uh, so politics and crimes and like so our hit stories were being demonetized. So then we had to look at the data to see that what would be the alternative source of revenue and find kind of research partners and institutions and agencies who would be interested in commissioning documents, documentaries around certain themes and have that subsidize the news that we wanted to do. So I, I would say that data has been a backbone of building a sustainable business model. Uh, I'm going to open it to the audience for questions and I will come back to it. Uh, does anybody have any questions for any of the panelists? Can yes. I just make one yeah, comment? Sure. You see? Uh, one thing that I have always wondered at is, you know, documentary filmmakers, irrespective of whether it's cover Leharia content creators or film institution documentary filmmakers or the for art um, uh, documentary filmmakers, it's amazing how you expect that one person to be so many things. He has to be a good writer, he has to be a good pitcher, he has to be a good salesman, he has to be a good fundraiser. Then he has to be a good producer to be able to manage the production within that fund. Then he has to be a good marketing man to be able to sell it out to some venues. And, and uh, now he also has to be an analyst because he has to <laughs> analyze which OTT platforms are actually going to give him some money. So it, it's about time, you know, something came up, a structural support to, to at least take away all that effort and leave the filmmaker to do the filmmaking. And, and, you know, that would, be, that would be a European state. Yeah. Any questions? Sir, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Kundo. It's the same even in commercial cinema. In today's uh, scenario, it's not only the documentary film, it is the same scenario with the commercial cinema that one has to do all the circus and not able to fully uh, invest time on creative, then when he has done his creative work, then the producer says, this is my money, I am the investor, now listen to me. Or it's the, the, it's the, it's the hero or whatever it is, uh, all that. Uh, it's the same scene everywhere, filmmaking, same, where you call it documentary otherwise. Now my question would be to Disha, uh, now that's beautiful that you come out with so much of local media work, I'm very happy about it, but tell me how safe are you reporters and people who, who report a story, especially when their uh, image is on the screen and their local uh, location is identified, how safe are they? Are, or what is the, the protection that is being provided? Or why should I come and tell you if there is so much of lynching around happening everywhere in the world? And, and you said there's a news... Uh, I mean, our world, yeah. our world, our world. It's our world, I mean. Our world, it's our world. She belongs to a bigger world, I mean. <laughs> She's got the whole cosmos. It's our world, small world. Now, point is, um, now the funding part, when you say it all gets, when the news is very strong, they get demonetized. How, how supportive are the other people, and why should they do it when there's a scare, when there's a, all that? Uh, please help me on that. Thanks. Um... I guess it's not safe in a word. Um, it still feels like it's essential to do it, even though it's not safe. And I think that we have a um, incredibly 
brave set of journalists who have kind of planted themselves in this region, which is full of dakus of the world. Every week we have, we've just recently had a fake encounter killing of a decoit and we had a bunch of reporters who were rushing to cover the fake encounter killing and speak to many, many people. So, um, so I think that there is a stubbornness that this, this is, it's crucial that they are reporting on certain stories and um, that this is a voice that otherwise nobody hears. You only hear about uh, Bundelkhand in maybe two months when the rain fails every year and it's in the papers for drought, but even that's such an old story that otherwise it doesn't really matter. Um, so, so I think that, um, I don't know, we struggled with the patriarchy for thousands of years and we still keep doing what we do, right? So, um, so the danger isn't really something that uh, stops us from doing the work. It's been really a big part of the work that we do is to have a network of journalists, so to have security in terms of numbers. So, so one of the challenges of, say, expanding this network across North India or across the country has been that if you have one lone woman reporting in a district uh, with no support, then it can be challenging. So we went from having a team of 10 women per district to downsizing to two women per district. So if there is a story which is going to cause uh, some kind of a backlash or is not uh, safe, then they, they'll always be reporting in pairs. And there's a lot of uh, communication that happens over digital networks, at least to say that this is where I'm going and this is what I'm doing. And if you don't hear from me by this time, then I might need some kind of uh, support. So there's a lot of keeping in touch and there's a lot of investment that happens and has happened over the last 15 years in ensuring that they have some forms of support. Um, it's become more and more unsafe, I think. I mean, like right now, this month, I feel like even if you report on a midday meal in a district, you could be thrown into jail. And we that's our bread and butter. I mean, that's what we report on. The highest number of our stories are on rural infrastructure. So if that can throw you into jail, I mean, you don't really have to report on any kind of communal or controversial issue. Um, in terms of funds, I think that um, one of the things has, to, uh, has been to not be very dependent on local sources of revenue. And in mainstream media, the main source of revenue would be advertising. So you don't have paid journalists on the ground. You have stringers who are getting advertisements from local influencers. So the Sarpanch in the village or the district administration is also advertising. Local businesses who are quite political are also advertising. And we haven't ever got that kind of advertising. I mean, we have very strict policies around advertising. So to keep a little bit of distance from where the content is being created and where the money is coming from, which also the flip side of that is that you're creating content by and for a, a rural audience, but then you're depending on maybe an urban audience to, to fund that. So that has been one of our big challenges with Kabbalaria, which we will continue to struggle with unless we have a subscription that works. You know, that the rural consumer finds it worthwhile to pay five rupees for a week or a month of, digi of digital news content, which we're not really there yet. Thank you. Any other? Madam. Over here. Being a coach of this game, you have tossed the ball to the both right off and right off players with that term of value which I want to use one more word, utility value. With your tossing, both have given different opinions, starting with our, uh, the great man, Mr. Kunda, just told how the film division has been started. And it was an era, what he has reminded also. We are very curious to see those documents before the future film starts, with the golden memories of even today, I can remember, just by seeing this Sir Frank Corell, that is a, uh, Orel, uh, a great bowler, Sir Gary Field Sobers, just for a flash second, by seeing the film divisions, we were thrilled by these days. But uh, this generation are missing because every day they are seeing through the tube, tube or anything. But any attempt afterwards has made either by the government or by the private uh, institution to make it uh, that the current trend should be continued. Because most of the documentaries will be produced by the intelligent people. 
we are just questioning whether it reaches the common people in common what i am just questioning so, okay sir i will give the different and then you can answer all the four because i want that definition for utility value okay and the second the madam has told that uh, i appreciated that comment made by the madam it is not for art for the sake of art as my friend has pointed out now the thing is it is a question of funding are a producer who come forward to produce sorry, like sir, the sorry, documentary sorry sorry i, I sorry have to interrupt you we'll just take other questions because we're running short of time and mm. everyone can answer together yeah okay we'll finish yeah. with one minute sorry. okay sorry okay. i'll just move on okay. you, you had a now between the you know the people the area also where the news is you know the news item is situated and uh, the people viewing uh, does that in some way go against the fundamental purpose of having a very offline and a very hyper local and a looped if you may uh because the moment distance comes uh, you know with it comes a sort of feel good you know kind of peering into or sometimes just an armchair activism or sometimes you know like i mean i'm just thinking out if i stay in a particular suburb and you know if 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 there's a particular issue in that suburb the way i consume and respond to that news is very different from if i'm looking even in a film festival at a you know a sundar nagari kind of thing and it, it, there's a huge distance and the movement for me to create change is very different even if i would so uh, that whole purpose or that raise on the edge of creating you know this hyper local you know is that being challenged with the uh, digital i mean <laughs> i'm just very curious i'll just take other questions and then we can answer yeah fine uh, we have i think time for one yes Uh so my question is open to all of you it's uh, responding or building on what Mr Kundu had said about uh, some sort of an institution to support uh the directors or the producers who are uh, filmmakers who are supposed to do everything how about uh what my question is what would be required to make a platform so to enable e these people to possibly like in corporate institutions you go through the various different phases and say for example a collective of a few people changing roles at different points where one person is directing at a certain point one person is responsible for uh the funding one person is responsible for understanding the data different aspects what would be required to set up a platform that enables more artists to understand how the system works and to bring in more people from the corporate side to get access to the artistic side of it and we can take lalit uh hi thanks so much everyone um so actually i just just as being a, you know a filmmaker who's received an ifa grant and also has had the opportunity of working with the PSPT which a lot of people here have and actually i wish there was someone from PSPT here also making a presentation maybe someone like tulika but under the i guess my question to you was the, uh, and and just to share my experience i mean i found making a film with ifa i had complete creative control i had the rights as you say which is very useful um but the flip side which was that the budgets were really low and i actually had a similar experience with PSPT with with also knowing that i did not cut the rights i just want to share with you that as opposed to this i had um, the opportunity of working with uh, you know an international 
TV organization, well-funded. Here, the problem was that there was a lot of control or attempted control on the script, you know. So I guess my question is really about, you know, controlling production and the balance between having a good budget but having the freedom to be able to do your own work. I don't know if you just had a response about also the possibility of a better budget for IFA grantees, or, you know. Yeah, Mr. Kundu, would you like to first respond? A couple of responses. So far as the practice of screening a public service film before the main feature in the cinemas is concerned, it's a clause in the Cinematography Act, and the Supreme Court has ruled that that will go on so long as the act is not amended. But earlier, it was the it was mandatory to take those films from film division only. Now it has been opened up to all kinds of producers and, and a kind of a scam is running there where certification is given and actually the films are not shown. So, uh, but now because news is no longer a, a, a you know, a kind of prized um, uh, source of information because news flows to you from every other source. So it's also not really very relevant. A public service film would probably still be relevant, but it's still debatable. So. No. So far as the funding part is concerned or the institutional support is concerned, it's all a utopian thought, you know. Maybe some platform will come up which will provide this kind of a connectivity and this kind of a support to filmmakers. Uh, we all need to strive towards that. I think you should maintain your Quickly to respond to Lalit, uh, Thanks, Lalit, for bringing it up. It's always a struggle. I wish we had larger budgets. It's a question of, uh, of course, fundraising and how much money we can raise and how, so IFE supports all artistic disciplines, all forms, etc. How do we apportion it across the various things that we want to support? It's also, so every five years we have programmatic reviews by experts and the question of budget comes up every time. And this question that filmmakers will need more, will theatre wallas need less, will a musician need more? So it's a, it's a negotiated compromise of a figure that one decides and then runs with it. But on your other hand, no matter what budget you're giving out, we believe that there should be absolutely no creative control over the practitioner's work, absolutely no demand on copyright at all. And even if someday we are lucky enough to give large grants, that's not a compromise we are looking at. I think the f it's not a question of large funding, more control, less funding, less control. I think it's an attitude and a vision of the organization. So tomorrow, if instead of five lakhs, we are able to give 15, our principle and, and, and vision of not controlling an art practitioner's work remains. It doesn't change because money changes. I feel, that's what I feel. Um, my Second, quickly responding to uh, a platform, uh, I would like to share that for theater, India Theater Forum, Junoon uh, in Bombay, which is run by Sanjana Kapoor and Samira Aingar, and IFA has come together to create something called SMART, which we are running for the last four years. It exactly looks at one of the questions we are asking about filmmaking, that theater practitioners have to do everything themselves, right? Administration, fundraising building audiences, communication, all kinds of things. So we said in India, you can't, you don't have the money in theater to hire an arts manager, which most other countries do because they have the money. How do you make their lives a little, little better by sharing some tools, some techniques, something? So we've been running this program called SMART, Strategic Management for the Art of Theater. And uh, we've been managing to somehow raise the money for it. We've reached over, I think about 200 plus theater groups across the country, across region, in our various avatars of a residential program, a three-day workshop, a two-day workshop kind of thing. Cities like Bareilly, uh, Agartala, Pune, Bombay, all kinds of cities. If such an idea were to come out from filmmakers, from practitioners, IFA would be very excited to see if we can collaborate and do something around it. And I just wanted to add to what Lalit had asked. Uh, I think IFA is because IFA doesn't hold copyright, and at least how I sort of see the strength on an IFA grant, even though it is small, that it can be the very critical seed grant for a film. You know, when the film is starting, and that is when you need the least creative control to be able to articulate what you're doing in your vision, 
And if IFA can imagine itself also as that seed grant, so maybe five years later, you're selling to Netflix. But if right in the beginning, you have had that time and space to build your yeah. uh, film then, you know. So, yeah. Would you like to uh, just respond to A, the, the platform that they're talking about? What is the kind of platform that can come together, uh, which can bring more transparency for the donors and specifically for when you're looking at the Indian documentary from the international lens, A, how do you negotiate artistic freedom? And what, is the ki what are the kind of things we should keep in mind which include the new kinds of crews? Like we were talking about how in the morning, 10 years ago, the idea of a producer for a documentary was a brand new idea for us. Acha producer bhi sakte right? And now today, we also need an impact producer. And maybe someone for data. So if you can just talk about this sort of new vision for a filmmaker when they are. Yeah, in the, yeah. Mm -hmm. in the impact space, I can't really tell about the, you know, about the production side of filmmaking. But in the impact space, what's very important is, is, the, is the fact that you have an impact producer because sometimes filmmakers are activists themselves and then they are they take the film forward and they tend to live with, the, live with that particular uh, film and create change and work towards it. And they, they are a combination of filmmaker activist. And then they have the activists who are, who are able to, um, you know, do the activism part of it, but they're not filmmakers. And, um, and then you have the impact producer which bridges this gap, which, is, which has the same kind of values. You have impact producer, you have impact strategist, you have a whole set of uh, headings which come under the impact level, researcher, all kinds of things. And you raise a separate fund for impact. And so you have your filmmaking fund, and then you have your impact fund which you can raise. And many of the international organizations have funds which are um, basically given for engagement. And you can, you can give it, you know, you break it up and you say like phase one, I'm going to be doing this. Phase two, I will do this. Phase three, I will do this. So phase one is going. I mean, I've read a lot of proposals. Sometimes filmmakers send me proposals, and there will be a line which says, okay, what is, you know, what would you intend to do with this film after it's done regarding the society? And invariably, everybody answers it as community screenings. It has to be really thought out as to exactly what you want to achieve step by step by step in that answer. You can't just be community screenings. You know, it's the simplest thing to say, community screenings. But you have to break it up really well. And you have phase one, phase two, phase three. So you finish phase one, you raise funding for phase two based on all the evaluation and data that you have at phase one, and you bring it into phase two. So you have data analysis. You have a whole new, new lot of people who work under the impact space, yes. But saying that, we as a foundation are now say, setting up an impact cell. So we are going to be doing campaigning, on film campaigning. We are moving into that space now because we've tried very hard to grow people in the, as impact producers and it's been really difficult. So we are now working towards an impact cell and selecting films where we will be doing the campaigns for. So that's our next step. That's for filmmakers who don't want to do it. And if filmmakers get it, I mean, we work very closely with the filmmaker and sometimes the filmmaker wants to do it with, with, the, with the impact producer. And sometimes they just give, give the film over, analyze the messages of the film and analyze their goals. And then we just keep them informed on what is the processes that we're doing. I mean, that's, that's how it works. Good to know. <laughs> Disha, you had a specific question. Yeah, just to be quick and we can chat about it later as well. Um, it's not been easy at all. It's broken a lot of hearts in the organization to feel like we're moving away from something uh, fundamental. And I think that we were very, very attached to the print product itself because of histories of Dalit women um, not creating any knowledge, written knowledge especially, and there not being any written material available in local languages like Bundeli or Avdi. Um, so it was quite heartbreaking. I think that the, the thing was to move away from that into the larger vision of the organization, which was to have more voices from the margins creating media content and stories that don't get told by the mainstream press. And that's what Kabbalaheria as a digital platform does. Uh, so it hasn't moved really away from that foundational idea. Um, the other thing is that 
actually ironically even though the the digital network itself gives us a much wider audience and it maybe gives us um support and possibilities of networking for fundraising and for collaborations production wise and impact wise and things like that so it gives us a lot of possibility um it's it's not really taken away from how we work in terms of engagement with the audience so our reporters often meet their trolls on the local bus and chat with them it's not so distant actually i mean they know who they are they'll say that oh we're a fan of your work even though they you know say terrible things in fact doesn't sunita <laughs> call trolls fans yeah like yeah like one of the kavalera jan doesn't call them trolls she calls them fans which i thought she was an interesting she says that a broken clock tells the time correctly once in a day so you should keep <laughs> on the right side of your trolls so so you know they engage both with the troll and with the fan and and I, so i think that it's it's a very heavily engaged medium so we have been given this sign so yes what should i think you should not cross the border line you are repeated you know what finding funding the any documentary or anything you told you have put some restriction that is you should not cross the border line in that way you are told what is that stands for but crossing the border line means is it anti government in that way will you that means it seizes the creativity of the creator one knows if you go on putting the restrictions you should not cross the world just like a modern producers will do sorry we'll have to wrap up uh, but i think the panelists will be here for at least the next few minutes if not later if anybody has other questions sorry to rush everyone but thank you thank you so much i feel this is the beginning of a conversation and maybe more alternatives will come thank you